Hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce Odyssey podcast. Today I'm very excited to be joined by Neil Twa, who's from the Amazon growth consultancy Voltage. Um, welcome, Neil. Um, could you perhaps tell us a bit about how you started your business? So like probably many of you who are listening around e-commerce stuff, uh, we started uh, quite a while ago, um, or some of you maybe just getting started or considering it. Um, we just kind of started with the Amazon marketplace as a way to see if we could get some products to sell. Uh, so we started flipping products initially, finding some low quantities products that we determined would be good profit margins. And we kind of just started tossing them against Amazon to see what would happen. Uh, and we started that process in 2011. So we've been at this for eight years now. Uh, in terms of that. Of course, it's evolved, but literally we found some little uh, products and overrun stock of supplements uh, that we started running uh, and we found that they were making good profit. And, and then we moved from there to additional products. And then when we saw it was doing well, we just kept throwing every product at it that we could. We weren't brand building. We didn't have a super mega plan. We didn't sit down and write a business plan and then go to market. We just saw the opportunity, signed up and just went for it. So how did you, how did you choose the products that you were selling? Well, we basically, we were selling anything that would make a profit. I, I didn't care if it was fuzzy bunny slippers to grandma uh, or tents to the weekend warrior. At the end of the day, it had to do with the profit margin. Mm -hmm. uh, could we sell it for a good profit margin? Um, I had no particular love of any brand or affinity towards any market. It was really just down to, was it profitable? Okay. So how did you, I mean, did you work on, on trying to kind of dominate a category or did you just, you know, were you just lucky in the products that you, you found and... Yeah, a bit of luck and a lot of research. See, my background is in, it has a lot to do with data uh, and analytics, um, business management and software and technology. I had left IBM in 2007 uh, to launch my management consulting career in business called Icon Technologies. And we had done business and consulting and it had a lot to do with data-driven knowledge management, analytics. Uh, and for the time that I was at IBM, we did a lot with uh, human machine language learning, uh, latent semantic search engines, uh, and building systems of knowledge that uh, encompassed both intrinsic and latent knowledge uh, and how to distribute that in near real time to people who needed it on the fly to support customer questions and inquiries and other stuff um, to be able to give better answers. Uh, so with that background, when I saw Amazon, I thought, well, this is just a giant semantic search engine. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really see it as, hey, I want to build a brand on Amazon or, hey, you know, Amazon, uh, could change my life or become another component of the next decade. It really just had to do with, hey, this is a giant search engine and you can rank products on it and physical products. And I thought, okay, well, that's fascinating. <laughs> I think there's something to be done here. Uh, and I saw opportunity in the numbers and we just realized um, that uh, the component of Amazon, I think that a lot of people miss uh, is the opportunity to not get emotionally involved with the brands per se at first, but to get in, involved with the data-driven aspect of the model that mm -hmm. is Amazon and then adapt brands, which we did later on. We started to look at the kind of products that were selling more uh, to higher profit margins to individuals and groups. And then we started to work on brands after we got going. So when you say work on brands, could develop, what do you mean, develop your own brands or? We'd started to see patterns in the products and the data. And it said certain groups were segmented towards this. They were buying additional products in say kitchen and outdoor gear and stuff. And when we noticed that, we realized that we should be building brands off the products that we were already selling. So again, we didn't go and say, hey, you need a brand strategy, let's sell products. We were selling products and then said, hey, we should probably put these into brands. We should you know, make a brand strategy. We should have brand assets and we should register this and actually start looking at it like a uh, true brand building. Once we so these are, are these brands time. that you like that, you know, kind of uh, own brand mm -hmm. products that you only sell on Amazon? They are what's called private label. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we moved out of uh, what we call the product flipping stage, which I think a lot of people still get started in or this a shop your way to wealth kind of stuff, a retail arbitrage, wholesale arbitrage, online arbitrage. So and arbitrage really is a, in kind of reselling because um, I know drop I'm, shipping, it, yeah, drop shipping. Does anyone in make essence, money drop yeah. shipping? I'm not sure. Well, I don't play in the drop shipping world anymore. When I evolved past the the drop shipping product flipping model, what I actually realized is one of the things we weren't going to expand and be serious about as a business is creating standard operating procedures, creating brand assets, and then uh, defining our customer audience. And when we realized uh, that that was really how we were going to build the profitability and long term of this. Uh, we very quickly understood that the uh, double your understanding of the customer is to double your revenues. So as we built the brand asset of those products, we saw we started to have them manufactured for us uh, because the beauty of Amazon's system is similarity plus familiarity equals trust. 
And so as we built that brand and started to put more products into that brand, we had manufactured and created for us, which is defined as private label. Uh, The more we started to sell, the more people came back and bought more, the more subscribe and save customers we got. And the faster the business started to build in those brands more quickly, we would get people who come back and buy two and three products. We'd get them to buy off a one campaign ad in PPC and they'd buy two or three other products at full profit. And that's when we suddenly realized, you know, the brand development was an evolution of our next steps in this business Mm -hmm. model. So you think basically it's, it's very important for sellers to develop their own brands? 100% because at this point, um, Amazon is moving everything towards brands. We've been talking about this for years. (laughs) You can go back to my YouTube channel back to 2016 and hear me talking about Amazon's moving to brand building development and their systems are aligning with all of that. And then fast forward to this year and they're rewarding brands with better ranking averages, sponsored branded uh, videos, uh, beta email broadcasting for brands only, product targeting for brands only. Their, Their whole brand group is doubling in size. And they've been removing a lot of accounts that have to do with drop shipping, wholesale arbitrage, and they've mm-hmm. made a lot more. Uh, what do you mean by wholesale arbitrage? To get to the seller account open. Sorry, what was that? What's wholesale arbitrage? Wholesale arbitrage is I buy a pallet with maybe 52 items on it that are all one particular product. And I take those 52 and I look at Amazon and I say, is there already somebody selling that product on Amazon? And then I, what's called jump on their listing as a seller with maybe a slightly lower price point. And I okay. do what I try so to kind of, do. Kind of classic kind of retail reselling. Classic retail, sort of an online arbitrage. I got to get a penny below the next seller. My account seller status has to win what's called the buy box. And if I yes. do, then I make that sell on the next rotation. And then I try to sell through those 52. And I'm leveraging the other assets of additional brands. And I'm taking their branded asset, those 52 widgets, and I'm selling them simply for a profit flip. That's it. And when those 52 are gone, I might try to get 52 more, but more than likely I'm not going to. So I move on to another wholesale palette of products and I just repeat that process over and over Mm -hmm. again. And we found that in time, it creates a job. Uh, That business uh, literally is taking people from one job to another job. And here's how I know that from my own personal experience. We ramped up a 20,000 square foot warehouse, moving 10 trucks a week with 12 employees out of Salt Lake City doing wholesale FBA pallet drops. Um, We take those and ship them into FBA and then have them delivered to those brands. And we really created a a business, but we also created another job, Um, another 60 to 100 hours a week managing people, business, and trucks while still managing our own FBA or fulfilled by Amazon accounts, which had virtual assistants and brand building we took a rabbit hole foray, uh, a diversification, if you will, into wholesale pallet dropping and realized that was a very dumb mistake. Okay. Uh, and then about a year and a half into that, we shut the operations down, stopped that and, and uh, let get, you know, let everybody go okay. um, because it simply didn't have the profit margins. And we just created another job for ourselves. Right. And at the end of the day, it wasn't an asset. This is very important to understand. We had not built not just brand assets, but a business asset that anybody wanted. If we tried to sell that, nobody wanted it. We were just handing them a job. Um, mm-hmm. We weren't giving them a real asset driven business model. Okay. So very much have we changed that alignment to building businesses that are worth more in the end than any time during the business building phase. And those are assets worth hundreds to millions of dollars uh, at the time you sell them. And so mm-hmm. we very much focus on brand asset driven business models now. Okay. So I, I believe also you, you've developed your own software. We did. Uh, which is a, could you tell us a bit about that? So when I originally developed a, a software with my partners um, uh, and took control of it, it's called ASIN Inspector. And it was a product research tool really meant to help you dig into the analytical side of Amazon uh, by looking at uh, competing products and determining opportunity from those products to create a brand that would compete with them. Uh, remember, similarity and familiarity equals trust. So we would look at additional products that are already selling on Amazon and say, could we sell a slightly better one? Could we innovate it just a little different enough that we could register it in Amazon and that we could brand trademark it? And if those answers ended up yes, and the product was profitable, we create a brand around it and sell it. So the tool was basically data mining. And you've probably heard of other versions of it from Jungle Scout and Helium 10 and AMZ Scout. And there's a bunch of tools now. We were one of the first ones to develop this uh, back in 2014, 2015. So uh, there was another company running in parallel with a friend of mine who had started up a a launch product business called um, Zon Blast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zon Blast was about helping existing sellers rank their products through a, a combination of um, um, compliant Amazon compliant methods. Um, it was not black hat because a lot of people think some of the things we do are black hat. We operate in white hat. So we never get our accounts shut down. We're never in jeopardy. And 
uh, as recently about a billion dollars just went offline on Amazon with 12 brands that were found to be doing a lot of black hat stuff. Fake what reviews, kind of black hat things are there? Because I mean, it's obviously a closed system. What What is it? Well, is it if a, you buy accounts, that, if you run separate accounts, right, and if you okay. are going to get reviews or fake buys, or you're fake, using those yeah. accounts to take down your competitors, well, that's all black hat. Right, right? Okay. And they were all found to be using those techniques, group buys and stuff. And there was 12 or just about 12 of them equaling about a billion dollars in revenue. And they were all shut down. Uh, because they were competing and, and basically destroying the marketplace. So someone um, lost their shirt over that. Yeah, someone did. <laughs> Many people did. And they've gone in and closed a number of other accounts behind it, maybe not as large, but quite a few people who were playing in that. We play 100% by Amazon compliance. And so his software was running, ours was going. And then about a year and a half ago, we said, hey, you know what? Why don't we combine forces, build a, pro a brand called Six Leaf, and combine the product research with product launching. And then we'll evolve that into what we call product relationship management or PRM. It's the concept of moving FBA products from concept to research, validation to sourcing, and from sourcing to launching, and doing it all within a single ecosystem, kind of like what we call a CRM, uh, right? Which mm -hmm. would be a sales force or other mechanism. At this point, there's not a PRM in the marketplace. And that's where Six Leaf is going at this moment to combine those four steps of, of uh, selling and launching products on Amazon into one ecosystem that we're evolving right now. Uh, and the Six Leaf ecosystem has its uh, Phoenix Chrome research tool, uh, which data is third party audited for accuracy, ties to some of our seller accounts and other seller accounts for our data accuracy. It's using what's called the RISE algorithm. Uh, and you will see that it is accurate. We use it for all of our products and it's uh, validated by data, uh, third-party data analytics, and it's used to do, do product research at the next level, uh, helping you find what we call our green lights. If it's so not what, a green how light. Do, I mean, what, what are the, you know, how does it find good products to sell? What does it look, what do you look for in a good, in a good category or a good? Well, I mean, here's target. the thing about it, right? Because you can look at the individual product level, which a lot of people do. They'll go in and look at one product at a time. What Phoenix allows you to do, and, and in some capacities, the other product research tools do, is they'll go in and say, hey, I'm looking for outdoor gear, or I'm looking for an outdoor tent or shoes or so. Let's say something specific, right? Um, when you search it, it actually shows you on Amazon's platform. Uh, red, green, and yellow lights. It shows you by profitability, and you can actually go and see very quickly at a glance, which products are green lit in the profit columns and which are yellow and which are red. And so at that moment, you know, you're able to go and say, okay, I just want to look at these green light products. And then you can push them into what are called our seeds platform, at which point you can analyze them and start to look at them in a competitive brand format, determining profitability, market research, competition, saturation, at which point you can then decide if you want to build a competing product in that brand and then go to market with that product. Um, mm -hmm. It really helps you define it at the data level. Okay. So how does it, um, I mean, because obviously the Helium 10 and Jungle Scout are the, the market, well, other Absolutely. market leaders. They're the biggest. They're the ones. No, the biggest. Yeah. They're the biggest. How does, I mean, what, how, what does your software do that they don't do? Well, one of the things we do differently is we combine that data in, into the uh, product relationship management side, but also give people the opportunity to launch them in a rebate with Zonblast Next, which is automated. Uh, so once you turn determine that product you want to sell and have it manufactured, you can stay in our system to launch that product with a re, with a 100% compliant rebate campaign. At which point you can also turn on auto review automation uh, to help you get compliant uh, reviews that are legit from verified sellers. Uh, and so you're able to take that data accuracy and with confidence move it forward to a product launch. Now Helium and others do. I don't really like to talk in terms of competitive mm -hmm. differences. It really has to get down with. Why would I, why am I reading this data from the tool? See, you could use any one of those tools and read the data wrong. Uh, you could use any one of those tools and get your estimates wrong. You can use, what we do is we try to combine the knowledge and training with the tool set. So you actually understand why you're looking at this data and what it actually means. Data interpretation is a big component. Um, one of the things I will say in our defense is that our data is highly accurate. It is not over-exaggerated. Some of the other tools tend to have data that looks more at department and category level, which tends to say, well, this product could sell $100,000 a month and move 3,000 units. That's, that's okay, great. But what people don't particularly understand is the low profit margins and the high competition for a lot of those, and they don't really understand the saturation. So we tend to move at more of the node level with our data, and it's reflected in the tool 
because those are where the real product opportunities are, the real profit and longevity stands. And we kind of focus more at the niche level of those products within those brands. And that data is a hundred percent accurate. And then because of that, you, when you actually launch a product, you get more uh, closely uh, to the exact results you would expect to see from that product. How does, where do you get the data that goes into this tool? Is Amazon, does it, is it provided by Amazon or? Not all of it. Amazon won't do that uh, because they don't want you to know a lot of their data. It's very uh, yeah. proprietary. However, they will give us uh, API access just like they do for the other tools. And then after that, we have to use our experience, knowledge, our current seller accounts, to build our own algorithms to interpret that data. So do you scrape, do you scrape the site? Is that how you? But I mean, how do you how do you estimate the sales of a product? We pull it from the data from the sites from a, from products that are previously in our system, and then we do some scraping of the data within Amazon's terms of service. So it's one hundred percent compliant, and they know we're doing. Okay. It. Okay. Uh, but there's data we get from API, but all of that combines into just a bunch of gobbledygook if you don't have an actual perf uh, performance-based algorithm that helps you interpret that data and then return the results. Ours is called the RISE algorithm. And that algorithm basically takes all those different data points, some from Amazon, some from um, our accounts, some from scraping, et cetera, and then compiles it and displays it back as real estimates of sales. Uh, data forecasting and analytics. Oh, the so you take data points because you can well. get this, like a you know, you got the rank, and if you know the sales of certain products, then you can you can extrapolate. So you extrapolate from the data you have. We do. We extrapolate from the data we have, and we do our best to keep it as ninety nine point nine nine percent accurate, uh, based on accounts we're running right now in those categories that we can validate from actual sales. Okay. So I believe also you've got so you invest in other FBA businesses. Correct. Um, that's something which has got a lot of. It's quite. It's it's quite a la mode, isn't it? The, it is in, lately. <laughs> um, and because I found it interesting because, I mean, I, you know, I, you know there seems to be a lot of businesses piling into it at the moment and an awful lot of money going into it. Are you, you know, is, it, it seemed to me that, that there seemed to be a business there because presumably the FBA sellers were underpricing their businesses. They weren't just underpricing their businesses. It was actual market, fair market value. Let's, let's go back in the Wayback Machine here for a second, like to 2018, yeah. right? Uh, 2018 business evaluations for Amazon straight channel FBAs were a little bit harder to take to market unless that channel had additional revenue streams, additional marketplaces, or maybe even uh, an off Amazon marketing activity. Uh, with that, you would see about a 2.3, 2.5x. Uh, 2.5 of, of what? Of EBITDA. So the net profit margin, right? Okay. With the base margin of the business actually, that's what we call the low, bottom line, that's, right? That's quite, a low, that's quite a low multiple. You know, it was actually been that way for a long time. So that was quite average. But in terms of industry, in terms of SaaS, in terms of other marketplaces, it had been quite a bit low. In terms of a, a business with a real... Uh, off Amazon mass marketing strategy that could see three to five X. Yeah, that was kind of low. They were a bit undervalued. Um, but when you move forward in time just a little bit, what you noticed was uh, the, the change in people's adaptation of finally understanding brand building and development beyond just product flipping meant that the, there was a big movement between 2017 and 2020 for people to kind of get their brands fix, fixed and kind of get them into a status where I have a product with multiple brands and I actually have intellectual property and assets that are worth something. So as you get to 2019, you see that starting to move up towards 3X, 3.2X, uh, and you see the channel itself becoming more approved as a, a single purchase point. It doesn't require other marketplaces. You don't have to have that Amazon products on eBay or Walmart, or you don't need a Shopify account or a paid traffic strategy. You just need a very strong a brand maturity presence, more than 12 months, so much profit margin, minimum of 18% triple net. Uh, and you showed that in your business model and all of a sudden that came very attractive. And so the, the price point went up, but here's what gets fascinating. And this, this happened last year. I think it's a, a major shifting point since the time that I've been online and watched e-com come up since 97, uh, is that you know there was that huge jump into e-com during the 90s and with the tech bubble and the adaptation. But what's actually shifted forward in the last few years is the adoption. There's every bell curve of technology and growth has an adoption period. It's early adopters that hit early risers to, to adoption principles and then to, to maturity in the industry. And what I think we saw in 2020 could be defined as an e-commerce uh, maturity. Uh, in which people finally realized e-com was here, it's here to stay and brand driven and product affinity is really going to be online now because so many people were forced into it uh, mm. in 2020. And because of that, they were forced to, to push adoption ahead 10 years, literally. 
Um, and we saw growth in the first three uh, months, the first quarter of 2020 at 10 years growth in three months. It just went, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, everybody who was on the edge or thinking that this wasn't a big deal, were suddenly online buying. They had to. Uh, with that push forward, uh, was a radical change in the valuation of these companies, especially on Amazon. And now we jumped between 3.5 to 4x uh, in terms. Which of I mean, if you got to, so you got companies. It seems to me you got companies like Thrasio, right? Correct. Gone from now, they're selling at a you know kind of 30 time multiple. I'm just making this figure up. About a, a year ago, than... they were at 30 x. Well, 30. I'm just saying. So they were buying companies at two or three. And then, you know, but their company was worth 30. It's almost like a kind of arbitrage thing going on there. That they're almost, it's a, you know, a special acquisitions vehicle, a SPAC, um, and that, yeah. you know, special purpose acquisitions vehicle. So at the end of the day, that SPAC is really a um, special purpose acquisitions company, let's say that correctly, uh, is uh, towards their goals and, and growth. Early adoption was basically to say, how many of those could we suck up before this, this growth market, this uh, this multiple hit its mark. And, and they saw that opportunity and jumped on it uh, about a year and a half ago. And that's why they were able to lead through that, that market change that occurred in 2020. Uh, but there's about 40 of those companies out there now all offering very similar type of payment structures, acquisition model structures. And it really has a lot to do uh, with the Amazon brand itself. Uh, and because of that, you know, investors jumped on it very quickly. Now, is it a bubble? I don't know. I think there's a little bit of bubble, but as in all early adoptions, the, the baseline of the business, the model, the industry, and what's being happened is not fully leveraged yet. It's not fully laid out. Mm. So what we're going to see is all these early adopters with all this investment and in capital. Uh, it, there's some dangers to that market. I know that even the federal government right now is taking a harder look at the SEC specifically to determine if this isn't some sort of you know overestimated, over-exaggerated uh, returns, uh, not a Ponzi scheme per se, but just overinflated, and they're wanting to pull in and see if this is where this goes. Have you got, I mean, is it, you know, is it that, so you get, like, you, they buy up lots and lots, you buy up lots and lots of small FBA sellers, right? Mm -hmm. Each of whom presumably have their own small set of products and they've got their own factory and you take them in-house and you obviously have better, you do, you know, better, better you know, SOPs, development. growth capital but, and things they don't have. But do, you, but do you end up with just a lot of very disparate brands and become like a like a kind of conglomerate, which is and conglomerates are, are generally valued at less than the sum of their parts? Well, no, because if you look at Coke or Pepsi or any other major industry, you'll find they have 20 separate brands below them. Yeah, but they're all drinks. I mean, if, you, if you've got just like, one example. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying it. Yeah, conglomerations can work as long as the brand sub brand of that conglomeration is strong. Yeah, uh, and they're seen as individual brands. Uh, even if, say, PepsiCo owns Gatorade, Gatorade itself is seen as a very strong brand, and it became a brand line asset on Pepsi's balance sheet. Right. Yeah. Uh, so in that way, Voltage Portfolios, which is our company, looks at each individual product and brand line as a part of a collective. So as we look at, say, sporting and outdoors good or healthcare or kitchen and supplies, we're looking for strong branded products within that segment to build a portfolio of kitchen products in that segment. Uh, what can happen is that that strong brand segment with growth capitalization and, and strong standard operating procedures that follow a growth model uh, can be used to basically pull that, say, kitchen product brand together and sell them all to KitchenAid. Uh, who buys all of those as one conglomeration. They buy them all as one portfolio of branded products and add those all to their product lines. All the risk has been taken by the owners, mm -hmm. managed by us, and they're basically buying a working asset that's been proven and validated. So this is not a new thing in the world of business. It's just new to the world of Amazon and e-commerce. And because mm -hmm. Amazon, you know, e-commerce is trending so hard and will be changing the, the, uh, the face of our world, I think, uh, in terms of digital commerce and last year's real jump start. Um, and you can look at the data behind it. Forrester Research and Bank of America published a deal that said, you know, by 2030, $21 trillion is going to come online that was previously offline and all the movement is being made. So we're, again, we're just at the top end of what is that full adoption of that bell curve. And it hasn't been fully matured yet. So a lot of the things we're seeing with like Thrasio and stuff and their, their desire to go IPO and things, this isn't, this isn't fleshed out yet. We haven't seen where it settles. And personally, where we're headed to the point where we think it's going to settle is, you know, there's a race, obviously, to acquire these businesses, but there hasn't been a race to acquire the best brands, a race to acquire the better products and look at the two, three, four year strategy 
And that's where we're going. We're looking at products and brands that not only have maturity in Amazon's marketplace, but have a limited maturity in the scope of the of the uh, world. They are not seen on infomercials. They're not out in the major marketplaces. You don't see them everywhere. You don't see them advertised online yet. These are breakout brands that currently haven't matured past Amazon. And those are the ones we're looking at. And our strategy going forward is to take them and move them out into that greater marketplace okay. beyond. And we don't need 50 of those to do that, right? Um, it's a, a matter of an investment strategy that says, well, we can buy 10 of those and one of them will go to a hundred million and the other nine, you know, you know, they may not do anything or we'll sell them off individually later. It's a very different strategy than the market is currently segmenting. And that's where we're going after. Okay. Interesting. So, cause I wonder whether, I mean, you know, it seems to me cause you know, all of a sudden there were all these companies coming in and buying all these FBA brands. And I just want to, it must be Falling interesting to be, sorry, what? Well, they're falling over each other. And what's going to happen again is that uh, one component of what I just said was the relationship driven aspect. At this point, it's like you go to the major dealer. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Uh, uh, this is off the top of my head. So I may not say this correctly, Trevor, but <laughs> forgive me for a second. We'll work it out. It's the very similar analogy to I sell the car myself or do I take it to the big dealer and take a lower markup, but don't have to deal with selling it myself. And so I go down to the major dealer and say, hey, do you want to buy my widget? I'm willing to take 2.5x for this when I could probably get 3.2 somewhere else. I just want it off my hands and you guys will give me that money and we're going. Yeah. Similar to the way you take your car into the dealer and you trade it in or you sell it to them versus doing it yourself. So what we've watched is the segment of uh, that is occurring and what people aren't seeing is um, in that similar analogy, they're not seeing the blowback of that. They're not. It's starting to happen in the inner discussions and the conversations I'm having with people while they got a good valuation, they think for their business, once they come back from that moment, they realize that probably wasn't the best thing. Like this wasn't, you know, I, they have a lot of emotional driven aspects to their, their products and the brand and the sweat they put in and the tears and blood they shed and the credit they borrowed or whatever it took for them to get to that point to sell that business. And they're very emotionally hedged into that. And when they see these bigger brands, just take it and swallow it. And then it disappears. And they're like, well, what happened to my baby? They're, they're not really that happy with that. They may have gotten the money, but they didn't get the, the joy from selling the business. And mm -hmm. where we're seeing the changes in a lot of relationship driven activities in the folks we're talking to directly, um, it is, look, we're going to take this, we're going to incubate it, we're going to grow it, and we're going to move it into the market. And someday you'll be able to say, hey, look, that was the brand that I created. Now look what it's doing. Um, and where it's going to be a lot of changes in relationship driven, because right now it's just how much can I get for this? And people are falling mm. over each other when very quickly it's going to settle down to who do I actually want to sell my company to? And where do I actually want to see this go? Okay. Because um, I can imagine if you're, you know, a category winning FBA product, your phone must be ringing off the hook at the moment. So well, many... yeah, to some degree. And, and again, most of these companies are not selling bestsellers. Uh, and you have to remember the market share of, of Amazon. It's about 2.5 million active sellers, right? Uh, in that 2.5 million active sellers, we estimate that uh, less than 80% of those are brand driven, but they have product opportunities that can be turned into brand driven opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and Amazon itself is moving that direction, right? It really wants to adopt, att uh, attract and grow brands. And that's one of the things it's working very hard right now to move its system towards. They don't okay. want to be eBay. They don't want to be seen as the garage sale of the world, right? Uh, they want to go after Walmart and they believe their attempt at this is going to be brand driven uh, and, and following the segment of what Walmart has done over the years, uh, as you probably maybe noticed and others are listening, maybe noticed um, Amazon's moved a lot of its brands inside of Walmart uh, and Walmart has moved some things in reverse. Now, Walmart itself has developed a lot of brands out of its current lineups where it previously sold other people's brands. It's now pushing most of its products to its own brand lines. Uh, Mainstays is one of their brands, right? Uh, if you go into Amazon, uh, to Walmart, excuse me, you'll see a lot of the brands that you previously couldn't name are actually brands that Walmart developed itself and brought those products in. In the same uh, way that Amazon is doing, it's Amazon Basics. And it's, it's uh, yeah. That's exactly right. They're moving towards their own brand driven. Now, one of the things you can do on Walmart and Amazon, of course, is sell your own third parties and make no mistake, over 70% of all the products sold on amazon.com come from third parties. They come from small businesses uh, to mid-sized businesses and only the larger conglomerates make up about 1% of all of those sales. The rest of it is people like us and, and third-party sellers who are building businesses. Uh, it is the backbone of the dot-com for Amazon. So if people say Amazon wants to kill that, they're very wrong. They don't want to kill 80% of their business. What mm -hmm. they're looking to do is sift it. 
they're sifting it because they want to look at the brands and people who are very serious about staying in that brand network. They just don't want to be seen as product flippers anymore. And they don't want people taking advantage of the system, which is what's okay. been happening over the last so few years. What do you think the most successful Amazon sellers are doing at the moment? I mean, I think you've touched on this quite a bit, but... Well, since I happen to know some of them, and we are in one of the top 5%, and I know some top 1% sellers, I'll tell you what they're doing. Uh, what they're doing right now is continuing to do the same strategy we've done for the last five years, and that is brand diversification. Uh, as they're moving certain brands in the market, they're continuing to expand product lines in their brands. Uh, they know one thing that many sellers don't at this moment, I'll go ahead and tell you. Uh, and that is beyond five products and SKUs, if you will, inside of Amazon, you reach certain levels of brand uh, awareness that Amazon wants you to, and it rewards you inside of the system. So the more products you put in your brand, the more money you make on Amazon. Right. And these top sellers absolutely know that. And the difference is they're not just flipping products and crap for profit. They're actually continuing to diversify into their brands with additional product values that the customers they've identified in their niche want. And they're getting those products in front of them more and more in a continuation strategy. Uh, so they're developing deeper into their brands. And then they're doing, again, what I mentioned was brand diversification. What does that look like? It means if I start brand A and I have a good product segment and maybe 10 or 20 SKUs in that brand, and that brand is doing three to 5 million a year, I can go and diversify that into brand B. And I can start selling back into that same segment of market and pull another three to five million out of brand B in the same niche, same segment that brand A is in. And I can do that a hundred times, right? So I can continue to scale vertically and laterally, horizontally, if you will, uh, into the marketplace by brand diversification. And this is an adaptation of a strategy we started six years ago uh, and showed people how to do this. <laughs> and it's one of the things we've taught and diversified and, and other sellers are catching on to it now. Uh, it's, it's not really innovation, it's adaptation so uh, to the way Amazon continually developing new products in opportunities in the areas and the additional brands, right? If there are three to five brands that I'm competing with, let's say in my outdoor niche, we discussed a minute ago, uh, I can go ahead and pull in two or three other brands that compete with them. And I can become the three out of the five brands in that niche. Mm -hmm. When people go in, they don't realize that they're choosing one of my products, one of my brands when they buy the product. Mm -hmm. So these are what, so you compete against yourself to a certain extent, Correct. is that what you're saying? Yeah. It, to a degree I am, but it's no different than me competing with the fourth or fifth brand in that market. There's plenty of market share. They just have the rest of it. All I'm doing is taking up the rest of the market share. Okay. Interesting. So what do you think? I mean, what, what do you think the future holds for Amazon? I mean, it's got a lot of, you know, I, there's a, a lot of talk of, of antitrust and, you know, how, how Amazon is becoming too dominant. You, there are talks of that, yes. What do you what do you think? What do you think um, the future holds for it? If Amazon becomes the thousand pound gorilla, it's about a nine hundred pound gorilla right now. Uh, my personal opinion is it will potentially be broken up. Um, how would it be broken up? Which you have to realize is the dot com is not their money maker, right? Uh, with the current shift in their leadership, with Bezos stepping out and the VP coming in, uh, excuse me, the, the the VP who stepped up and is now the CEO. Uh, of the market, he's coming a little bit under fire for some of their practices. And they're really starting to change some of their practices because it's uh, it's going to look like antitrust if they don't make internal changes. And he's doing that. And you're seeing it through the levels of business and the businesses we just talked about who were basically putting Amazon at a risk position. They removed them. Even if it removed a billion dollars, they removed the risk from their market. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see them continue to do that. They're going to continue to make it a little bit more difficult to sign up. So it's harder for people who want to uh, sabotage the system uh, to move on to something simpler, right? Go to another place and sign up and do it over there. Amazon itself um, is going to be borderline antitrust if they get to a, the thousand pound gorilla mark. But again, make no mistake, .com is not where they make their money. It's the web services. It's AWS mm. server side and data analytics side that they're pulling from these products and from the marketplace. And of course, from their servers and hosting side and their platform is where their moneymaker really is. So do you think they will continue? Because the way I look at it, I see Amazon currently is both, you know, a retailer and also a marketplace. Do you think they're going to be able to continue to be both? Uh, yes, I do. I think you're going to see Amazon as its basics brand and stuff is actually going to be reduced only because by, um, Customer driven uh, affiliation. If you look, you'll see that um, most people do not have a trust of Amazon's basics brands or some of its other brands and are becoming wholly aware that those brands are separated in the marketplace. Uh, as people are getting smarter in their purchasing, as more of them come online, 
it will be harder for some of these practices to continue. Um, if you are brand registered and brand trademarked, Amazon won't take your products. They won't mess with you. In fact, they'll give you direct reps and help you lift you up. If you're jacking in their system and they see an opportunity and you're not registered or brand trademarked, then they will go make an Amazon basic brand out of your product. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear about that online. And people say, you know, Amazon stole my products or they'll steal your products and make them their own. What those people are not doing is building real businesses. They're not protecting their IP and therefore they're open for anybody to go in and do what Amazon has done. They just happen to like uh, take a victim status by selling at Amazon and then saying they're victimized by Amazon when they didn't protect themselves in the first place. Mm. Um, I don't really blame Amazon for that. I blame the ignorance of the people teaching or doing the businesses uh, that are not teaching people how to protect themselves correctly. It's a very, very key component to what we do is telling people how to build a real structured business with IP that's worth something and how to protect yourself against Amazon and even how to go compete head to head. I mean, we have products we beat Amazon on all day long. They can't compete with us. We're the better products. We're at higher price points. People see the difference and you can mm -hmm. compete with that. So Amazon itself, I think, is going to continue to push very hard towards brand building and brand development. Um, they're going to reward the businesses who are building brands and doing good business. And they're shutting down, closing and killing those who are not. And I, that is not changing. And I think it's going to start doubling down here. They've shown us uh, their hand and they, they're going to go faster and harder after it. One of the things they are struggling with right now, just kind of wrap that point up. They are struggling with inventory and uh, manpower. So they're having a hard time getting products through the docks right now. They're having a hard time getting uh, storage. It's never having a hard time. Yep. They just killed uh, some of the IPI rules and changed the uh, account rules uh, just this week. I think the AI system went in and just basically killed. It did for a bunch of our accounts. Uh, it took away a bunch of inventory capabilities. Uh, for example, if you had 50,000 units of shelf space, you got 20,000 now. Uh, which is ironic because our account reps are telling us, you know, for prime and holiday season, you need to be sitting, you know, shipping more into Amazon. And then literally two days later, after our account rep tells us that Amazon cuts in half all of our inventory. And we're like, why did you just do that? That was a, what are you doing? Um, they're forcing people to go to third party logistics, three PLs, uh, mm -hmm. keep their product and then ship it to Amazon in smaller quantities. They're running out of uh, shelf space because they don't have the manpower to move it. Uh, and you had a whole nother problem dealing behind that here in the U.S. with unemployment benefits and some people being paid a thousand bucks a week to sit at home instead of go to work. Uh, and so they're having a lot of problems with the supply and hiring and manpower to move this. And, and they're having to restrict inventory levels and stuff to keep up because they can't hire enough people because they're in hyper growth mode. They were up 60 percent at the fourth quarter of December 2020. That is a, a massive hyper growth problem. Uh, Isn't that crazy for 20 year old business? It. Yeah, because they are a huge infrastructure and they're trying to open more warehouses and hire more people and move more product faster. But in the meantime, they're having to cut some of the storage limits and stuff. And it's a bit of a pain for those who are in it. Um, those who are adapted, those who are serious, those of us who are at the top end of the sales spectrum. We already had three PLs, relationships and risk management in place like you run a real business. Uh, so we're not fretting over it. It's a bit of a pain and we'll deal with it. But um, those who will really suffer are the ones who haven't been taught or trained or just learned to build these as real businesses and treat them like a real business, a real product driven asset business. And unfortunately, they're they're whining, they're complaining, and it's hurting them. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are going to go out of business because of it. Right. Okay, so last question. Um, mm -hmm. um, what has inspired you recently? What has inspired me recently? Um, it can be anything. <laughs> can't, that's a great question. Um, throwing me a curveball. What has inspired me recently? Um, I was on a, uh, I, I have a, a little podcast I started only for, for fun. It's called the IDGA of podcast. And I've had a few guests come on and it's a totally open, I mean, everything from politics to religions, to theories, to just anything people want to talk about, not just business, but life. And there was a gentleman on the other day, he actually talked about a business thing he had done, how he took a company from zero to 5 million in the first year and, and all the things that they had done. Uh, his name is Matt and the, the brand was called uh, Lions, Not Sheep. Uh, and the brand has a, a whole series of merchant uh, products and stuff that it leads to coaching and training about how to become a lion, not a sheep in today's world, which I thought was fascinating. And that was kind of inspiring the brand, the ideology, the guy behind it, Sean Whalen, uh, who's leading that. And then Matt, of course, who has a marketing team that helped them move it to market. They did a brilliant job. Uh, and they just had a big event to, to teach everybody basically what they did. I was inspired by that because I like the idea of the brand and the concept. And, you know, we, we kind of see the world uh, a little, you know, differently in some ways we all do about what to do with life right now during the certain major changes that our world has gone through. And 
uh, they were just kind of uh, inspiring to me to remind us that uh, we can be lions in this world. We don't have to be sheep. We can question, we can ask questions. We can look at things very differently. We don't just have to do what everybody else is doing. Um, we can separate ourselves and that's okay. Uh, and it was just, it was inspiring to me, their story and the success they had and, and the purpose behind it. Okay. It sounds a bit like Machiavelli who said, uh, you need to be a, a fox to avoid the traps. A, lion to squ- <laughs> a fox to avoid the traps and a lion to scare away the wolves. I like that. I think of it as more like I'm the salmon running upstream while all the other ones are going down. So I have to be have careful you, about the bears. Have you read The Prince by Machiavelli? I have not. Uh-uh. You really should. Okay. I'll take I'll that into copy. <laughs> uh, have you read Feel the Fear and Do It Anyways by Susan Jeffries? No. That's one I recommend to everybody who's willing, who's stepping through certain, certain things and questioning, is it a right time to start a business or is it the right time to expand or the right time to do things? Uh, right. Well, I'll put some, I'll put some in the, uh, in the blog post that goes. Definitely do that. Feel the fear I'll put, and do it anyway. It's a I'll big component of success in business is to just keep going, keep moving. That certainly is true. And do it anyways. Neil, it's been great talking to you. Maybe we'll talk. It'd be very interesting to talk to you again in a year or so and find out how you've got on. Very good. Thanks for your time, okay. Trevor. Appreciate you.